again everyone, Mary Rose here at Stitch Bliss Corner. Um, now I'm just going to uh, mention a few things here. I'm going to do a little bit about um, a designer, Teresa Wensler, because I do have commenters that ask me to look into designers you know just present a little bit about them so that the pieces that they're stitching they know a little bit more about the person that designed that piece so I'm going to uh, be presenting Teresa Wensler today uh, not not massive because there's not really a lot about her uh, I my husband did find a picture of her but I'm not going to show it because I think uh, she seems to be a fairly private person and um, because it took him a while to find a picture, I think she'd probably prefer it if I didn't show that. Um, so, yes, she's coming up. Um, I just want to say a few things about my previous video on Elizabeth the I. Uh, thank you so much for the lovely things that so many of you have said about that video. Uh, it wasn't, for my eyes, it wasn't as good as I would have liked it to be. But then how could you ever uh, do Elizabeth justice? She was just such a complex character and I think uh, an unforgettable character in history and always will remain so. Um, now someone did ask why I felt that Elizabeth didn't want to or didn't see the need to leave an heir uh, you know, to actually risk getting married and to to leave an heir to the country that she loved. And I think there are three reasons why Elizabeth didn't marry and was never going to marry. Uh, the first one was what happened to her mother. That would have been, you know, she was only two when that happened. Uh, her mother was there and then was just taken away from her and she was n never saw her mother again. So that, that would have, you know, she was only two, but still, things can sit in your subconscious, can't they? And then another big reason, I think, is because of what happened to Elizabeth's cousin, Catherine Howard, the fifth wife of Henry, who was only in her teens when she ran screaming down the gallery of Hampton Court to try and get to Henry to beg him for forgiveness uh, and for her life and she never did get to Henry um, they say he wasn't in residence anyway but that image in Elizabeth's head and Elizabeth was only nine at the time and experts do say that if you're nine or ten and some really traumatic thing happens to you whenever you think of it it's like it happened yesterday and from personal experience, I can tell you that is quite true. And you try not to think of an incident that does that to you. And I think Elizabeth may well have tried to follow that path, which would have been very difficult. And then, of course, the third and most compelling reason, in my view, was what happened to another cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, who was deposed Within, within months of her child being born. Mary was no longer required as far as the Scottish aristocracy was concerned. She had provided an heir and the heir got a protector and Mary wasn't needed anymore. And But for Elizabeth's protection, who knows what would have happened to Mary actually. Um, but anyway, um, and of course, it was understood towards the end of Elizabeth's life in her court that James, Mary Queen of Scots' son, would become King of England as well as Scotland when Elizabeth died. But Elizabeth didn't actually formally recognise that that would happen. Maybe very late in the piece she did, but she always said she would not put herself in a winding sheet well, he was well. She was still alive. Uh, that she wouldn't uh, confirm him as being her successor 
because, of course, she knew that as soon as she did that, there'd be all sorts of jockeying round him to influence him, and she would lose her power a bit by bit, and she wasn't going to do that. So that was just to answer that question. Now, Kate, the lovely Kate of Kate's Crafting Corner, she did leave a comment that part of Elizabeth's dress has been found. They think, they're just checking the provenance and everything. So that's quite an exciting development because she had hundreds of dresses and yet the strange part of history was that none of them seemed to have survived. But this one might be the real McCoy, so we'll just have to see what happens there. All right, so that is the final part of Elizabeth. Now, just before I go on, I have to apologise to Bendy Stitchy because I accidentally deleted one of her comments. And I think what happened, I was on my iPad and I was trying to love the comment and I accidentally pressed thumbs down. And I, then I panicked because I thought, oh, I don't want her to think I'm thumbs downing her comment. And I pressed delete to delete the thumbs down and the whole comment disappeared. So I'm very sorry, Michelle. And at the same time, I mean, I should be steered well clear of my iPad when it comes to answering comments because I ended up somehow deleting a comment that I had put on uh, Ladybird Stitches uh, site. That's uh, the lovely Lorna. And I had to apologise to Lorna as well. So <laughs> I just will have to be extremely careful with my iPad because it's like a lethal weapon in my hands, it appears. So anyway, uh, I thought I'd just mention that to those two people. Uh, now, where do we go from here? I think we'll go on. Should I show you Scout? I suppose I should show you Scout first. Uh, because the horse has a head and never has a no nostril been so satisfying to stitch. It was just wonderful. So here we are with Scout. And there's his head. I've still got a bit of my scaffolding on there. But I just thought that all the people who've been so patiently waiting to see the head go on to the lovely horse, that I would show that. He's still got a bit of an ear to go, but, um, and the rifle has got to go up there too. So I'm getting now towards the finishing line, and that means that I can concentrate on my next lot of pieces. Uh, one of them will be Harlequin, of course, um, then also... A, the Robert Frost piece, the wooden piece. I'm still doing my tiger, uh, but I will get onto those soon. Now, well, not this video, but in a future one. So anyway, that was Scout. Pop him over there. Now, let's get on to the wonderful Teresa Wensler. Now, I have some pictures here of some of her work which I will show you. And I'll just do an outline of her life and her motivation. And then I also have to answer a question from Bumblesby. He asked about how to get some glitter on some water. He's stitching some water. And he's just asking how I put my a metallic thread on my work to create the sheen. Now the way I do it is probably not the way a lot of people do it but I just do it my way and that's that. <laughs> so we'll do Teresa first. She says she has always enjoyed doing artwork. She began with crayons and paper at a very early age. Her mother hung her work on the refrigerator door. I think a lot of mothers do that, don't they? 
She was always encouraged to draw different things, even when they were strange, abstract, winged things. She says she was a loner as a child and enjoyed enriching her imagination with fairy tales and listening to music. Television access was restricted for herself and her sister. Uh, well, that would have helped her imagination, wouldn't it? She would sit and imagine worlds inhabited by wizards, princesses and castles and dragons. Her favourite song at the time was Puff the Magic Dragon by Peter, Paul and Mary. Well, I remember that song and it used to make me quite sad, actually. You know, but poor old Puff. I mean, really. Anyhow. During her school days, she had lots of encouragement from her teachers, especially her art teacher, who felt that she could do something with her talent. The teacher challenged Teresa at every opportunity to push her boundaries and learn new techniques. Under his guidance, she tried pen and ink drawing, painting on various surfaces and clay modelling. She was accepted into the Pennsylvania Governor's School for the Arts during the summer between her junior and senior years. And talented students from all over the state came together at an area university for several weeks. They honed their skills and experimented with various arts, such as music, dance, theater, and others. Yeah, oh, well, an artist, music, dance, theater, and of course, written art, you know. She says it was an inspiring summer and this was what decided her on her choice of art as her preferred college major. She enjoyed school. Her good grades came easily for her. She was in the school band program and learned to play the tenor sax when she was in fourth grade. The saxophone was bigger than she was. <laughs> she also learned how to play the bassoon. She played in competitions and festivals and briefly the local symphony orchestra. She says that although she no longer plays an instrument, she misses the music very much, but music remains one of her passions, one of her greatest sources of inspiration. Well, if you can remember, uh, Marilyn Levitt Imblem used to be affected by music as well. So it does nourish the soul, doesn't it? Um, she says that she hopes that one day she can learn the piano. Now, after graduating high school, Teresa went to college. She describes that as a rather sporadic undertaking. She attended Penn State University for a year and then withdrew. So she must have been, you know, if you're a creative person, that can happen, can't it? She was 19 and a bit unsure of what to do with her life. She worked for a couple of years and this is when she met her future husband, Carl. She then decided to give college another try and was accepted into the Kutztown State College. Apologies to my American viewers for if I done that incorrectly. It's K-U-T-Z, I think. T-O-W-N. Unless that's an S in there. I can't read my own writing, but I'm sure you know where it is. She was there for one semester before again withdrawing. She was not satisfied with her course of study uh, and did not wish to waste any more time or money and was still unsure of what she really wanted. She had no motivation. After withdrawing, she went home and got a job in a sewing factory and she married Carl and she spent four years doing piecework in the factory and then that did the trick. She became frustrated and wanted to go back to school. And Oh, sorry, motivated to go back to school. She attended local community college, which had a challenging advertising art program. She rounded out her two year degree with as many humanities credits as she could. She says she dove into various history, sociology and philosophy courses. She returned to a love of learning that she had at high school. She thought of further formal education, but decided to put all her practical experience at work. At a creative circle party, she learned how to design for cross stitch. She started with colored pencils and graph paper. 
and found it difficult at first to get her head round the idea that a realistic picture could come from little squares. <laughs> the mysteries of the grid, she called it. Her first designs were stitched up as gifts and given to friends after a photographic record was taken of them. She submitted the photos to a design scouting firm. Rocking Horse Designs Trotter and Chestnut were, I think they were her first ones that she submitted to the Cross Stitch magazine and the rest was history. She designed part time while at the same time sold vitamins at a local mall. She was able to give up the mall job to work in her full time career. And I think I've got a picture, yeah, here's a picture here of Chestnut. Uh, I haven't got a picture of Trotter, although I might get into trouble from um, Harlequin because I think he actually printed me those off and I lost them. I don't know how I did that, but I do have some other pictures that he's provided for me to share with you. Now this one, this is the carousel horse called Paul. And you can see all the, the detail around the edges there. She is a real one for detail, that's for sure. I'm sorry about the buzzer outside. It's, I think it's someone with those hedge trimmers. I like the, the shears myself because they're quiet. Technology is very noisy, isn't it? Um, then this one is the carousel horse, Summer. And it does look very summery, doesn't it? Everything's busting out there. This one is Carousel Horse Winter. I wonder if she could have just allowed herself a few little red berries in that one. But I guess she was just conveying the comparative starkness of winter with the abundance of summer. That's quite a contrast. That's probably what she was going for there. Then we have Carousel Horse Spring. Oh no, I've got these probably incorrectly, you know, not in the right order, but never mind. Okay, and here is a carousel of what's this there. So she certainly captures the movement of horses. The little prancer there. And now we have some more whimsical ones. Here is her version of Rapunzel. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair that I may climb without a stair. I can remember that from years ago, you know, when you get um, stories read to you. And there are a couple of birds there. That one's almost lost in the clouds. So there's Rapunzel, then this one, probably an influence of her music, love of music, is called The Minstrel. And the dragon looks as though he's sitting there listening. It doesn't look as though it's going to breathe any fire though, does he? He looks very mellow. A mellow dragon. And here is a Christmas wreath. Of course, she's done so many. I've, I've just picked some just to show you. Give you a feeling of her work for people who haven't seen. Yeah, well, you'd have to be under a rock not to see it if you're interested in stitching. But if they haven't seen 
the variation in her work. And here is the English Garden Sampler. Romeo and Juliet. The Star Crossed Lovers. That has a mood about it, I think. That one. Woodland Fairy. What a scale there of the mouse. It must be a very small fairy. Tracery dragons. Oh, oh yes, I see. There's some, um, I'm just looking for the other dragon, oh, that way, it's dragons plural, oh, oh there's a blue one that way and a blue one that way, yeah. um, dragons, so there's a, a dragon there, and there's another dragon over here. So I was looking for a white dragon and a blue dragon, but they're both blue dragons. So that's pretty clever. It's very intricate, isn't it? I suppose it goes that way, but I don't really know. Reminds me of a frieze, but uh, yes, that's rather, rather stunning. Hmm. Then we have the castle sampler, and here's all the musicians down here. And then we have the peacock, it's a peacock tapestry. Okay, so there are a few other ones that I'm going to show you later, but I have a reason for keeping them for later. Okay, now then, here we are with Bumblesby's, Bumblesby, sorry, uh, his question about the sparkly. Now, how do I go about this? I did take some pictures. Oh, I'll show you this first, these two, which you have seen. People who have seen my channel, they've seen these before. So this is no great shakes for them. Probably no great shakes for a lot of people. <laughs> worry, worry about that. Um, these were two Asian ladies that I did. And this one I still haven't got round to, well I haven't got round to framing either of them and I've also got to give this a good ironing but anyway it's really just to go into the sparkly thread, the metallic thread, I don't know why I call it sparkly thread, I think I just do so. Um, <clears throat> Now, excuse my throat, it always goes when I'm doing floss tube. I have a lot of metallic thread throughout this and up here. Now, I've taken some close-up pictures of this with my iPad and I'm going to show those in a minute. So it's really just to give you an image of what this looks like in the first place. So I'll just take it back there so you can just have a bit of a look at that one. This was very enjoyable to stitch. 
um, because it's got so much lovely detail on it. You know, it's got this, um, that bird there, that's its neck and its beak, and it comes around, that's all its feathers. And another bird there, um, and another one there, there's the beak. But I, I, I do have some close-ups, so I'll show you that in a minute. And then I'll just show you the second one I did of the Asian lady. And that's that one. Now, in the original, this was just plain stitching. But I did a sheen over the top of metallic thread to give it a sheen. So it looks like satin. And you can't really probably see it on the internet, but it does sheen. And her hair there, I put some thread in there and I was very surprised <laughs> when I found out the kind of thread that I used because it's not really meant for uh, being used as metallic thread. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. So that's those ladies. Right, now we'll just see how this works as far as the glitter. Oh, well, I suppose I can show you Blingy Henry. Another one people have seen before. There he is, there's Blingy Henry, and that's his signature underneath that I stitched. I catched that. So that's Blingy Henry. Anyway, now then. That's what one of my commenters called him. I thought it was very appropriate. Right, now... So I'm just looking for some... See, there's some... Isn't that detailed? Oh, see here? Oh, my fingers, they just won't go in the right place. That is... The detail from one of the stitchings and that's all metallic thread there that I've gone through and gone over the top of the original stitching um, then I'll show you the couching as well while I'm at it. Oh, now, mention, remember I mentioned about the thread that I used in the hair to give it a sheen. <laughs> and it was this that is the um, sulky. That's supposed to be used for the gridding. Well, you know, I went shopping and I saw this and it was shiny. So I thought, well, I'll be able to put that in her hair. And it is in her hair, but of course, and it does sheen with it, but you can't see it. Um, and then I did some more lines there with it in. And here I've, I've put some lines of the metallic thread there instead of the beads because I'm, I'm not a fan of beads, really. I have to be honest about it. Um, I don't know why. I, I, I have done beads, but I don't know. Um, you know. They look, they look okay, but I I'm just don't particularly go for them. Um, now then, Henry, I was going to show you the couching. Where is it? I'm trying to find... Oh yeah, here we are. Um, this line down the side of her, her gown, that line 
all the way down there. That's all couching instead of the back stitch. And I'm, I do get a little bit frustrated with all the people that complain about back stitch. They don't have to do back stitch. So why are they complaining? They don't have to do it. They could do couching, which is thousands of times faster and looks a lot better in my estimation, but I don't really know why I go near technology because it just doesn't like me. Right. There's some more couching right around the edge there. All down there is couching instead of backstitch. And I think it gives a more fluid look. Um and I don't know why you do backstitch if you don't need to do it. It's one of those things that totally befuddles me, to be quite honest. Um, I've got it all down. Bottom of her dress here as well. It's a bit hard to see because it's grey. But that's all, and all round there is all couching. That's just so quick and easy. Anyway. To get on to Bumblebee's question, he was talking about glitter, be, uh, the metallic thread, because he has some water and he wants to get some sparkle on the water. Now I do have a piece here that I did. There's all my French knots. And this one went a little bit off the rails up here because I went to the half stitch, which I'm also going to do with Scout. And I did look at Caroline Mazio's way of doing your continental stitch or back basket weave stitch. And it's still keeping the fabric straight and not having it go off at an angle. Um, but I, and I was going to try and do that, but because I stitch for joy, I just, it made it a little bit too sort of technical for me, a bit too, oh, you've got to concentrate and it's fabulous the way she does it. And I think if, if I was doing it for someone else, for example, and I was really concerned about it going out of shape or something, I think then perhaps I would have made the effort to really try to do, do it in a more technical way. But because it's for me and I have a wonderful framer, I'm going to trust him to be able to, if it does pull out of shape a little bit with the half stitches for the sky and everything in the background, I'm going to just hope that he can just whack it into shape like he does with all the other things I give him. He probably wants to shut the shop when he sees me. When he sees me coming, he probably thinks, oh no, what's she going to do to me this time? <laughs> anyway, so back to what I was... Let's see now. So I'm going to try and show him. Now I'm going to use not the colour that I would use if I was going to try and sparkle up my my uh, ocean here. I'll have to use something that will show. So now this piece of thread, what's this one? Krynik Metallics Blending Filament. Okay, so that's a blending filament. I didn't even know I had one. But I think you'll find when, if you're anything like me, you get these metallic threads and they have this little bit of nylon running through them. And I'll just see if I can find some. It'd be hard for you to see it anyway on, on floss tube. But it does. It has this piece of nylon that you won't be able to see. Probably they do it that way because you're not supposed to be able to see it because it's going to be on a piece of work but you know what nylon looks like anyway you just can't see it it's translucent or transparent I should say so anyway trust me there's some there's some nylon-y stuff there now I don't use that the part that's 
there that bit I don't use so what I do is I take my my piece of thread right. then that little bit that's got the nylon on it I get rid of it so I just keep doing that until it's gone I mean I don't know maybe other people do this I don't know but you can see it there at the end of the thread. Hang on, sorry. See that black there? That is all that nylon-y stuff that you couldn't see. They must have to use that to reel it up, you know, to make it go onto the reels. So I get rid of that completely. So that all I have is the metal part or the thread. Now granted it makes it more difficult I imagine to work with because it's very light and gossamery. So when you put it on your needle what I do is I create a loop Gosh, how can I show you this? You see that loop there? And then I put it through, and I'm using a, another gigantic needle here so just to show you. I put it through the, the eye of the needle, and you might need to use a th uh, needle threader for this if you tried this you put it through the loop through like that and then well, because it's a giant needle I have to have a big tail on this Hang on a tick. Just trying to get a big tail on there. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Just hang on. So I've got my loop. Got my big needle. I'm putting it through. This of course would be a small needle. But anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> Here's the big loop through the needle hole. Now, right, then I put the needle through the loop and then I pull and it means that the needle is fairly attached to that now because it's looped through. It's like the loop method for a needle. You put the loop bit through pull the loop and then make the needle go between the loop and the thing. Well, anyway, that's how I do it. So therefore, although this is very flimsy, generally speaking, it's not going to keep falling out of the eye of the needle. It can happen. Sometimes it just slips and that's all there is to it. But most of the time, I've at least if my thread is a bit flimsy, at least I do have my needle that's pretty steady in there. And then, um, if I'm doing my stitching to get the sheen effect, I do not do a full cross. I just do a half stitch. So therefore, here we go again with one of my impromptu demonstrations it goes through fine you know it's not like it knots up or anything which I think always going on about chronic knotting up well it doesn't knot up that much if if you're not too um, ambitious with the length of your of your thread I guess so anyway so I just do it like that, just half stitches over the top 
of the water, which I would be doing here. So because floss tube doesn't really show glitter on the water, um, I won't bother to stitch it because it's not going to show anyway. But I would just do a line here and there on my water and I think it would make it glitter and glisten, which is what uh, Bumblesby was after. I think he's he's going to be or is doing a section of water on his cross stitching and he was just asking for advice on that. Now I'll just see if I've got a close up here of my stitching, maybe on Henry, that might show up better. If it shows up at all, which I'm greatly doubting, but anyway. On here, uh, I've got the half stitching. Over the top, I've got some gold. Maybe you can see those threads there. They're just half. So I don't have any problem with Krynik because I always take out, as I say, I always take out that filament in the middle because it just gives you, I mean, a bit, originally I used to keep it all together and I used to think, well, what's all this about? It's just giving me grief. So, oh, I know here's a better example because this has sort of got like a cotton filling in it. Who's this? Um, oh, this is Krynik again. This is imported polyester metallic blending filament. Hmm, okay. So this will be better because I think this has got red inside it. If you see there, there's the red. And you see it's got two. You've got the metallic part. You've got the metallic part there. And that's the bit in the middle. Now, I don't know if stitchers actually use the whole thing when they're stitching. Uh, maybe they do. But I always get rid of this middle bit. So I'll just take that off now. It does make it hard for something like this one, though. Because, see, this is even lighter. Even lighter than that other one I just showed you. So I'm not saying it's not fiddly. It certainly is fiddly. But it's better than having this, I don't know, knotty up sort of stuff that comes with it. But I think that's probably what knots everything up. That bit that it's blended with. Because of course it is a blending filament. They've blended it with cotton or nylon or whatever for their reel. But the actual... you know, shiny part, it's fairly strong. I mean, it doesn't, sometimes it'll break, but not that often. So my advice to anyone who is having grief with blending filament is to make t may, maybe take the blending bit out and just use the, use the other bit. Um, and if you anchor your needle in the way I showed you, which maybe I could do that just once more with a shorter needle because that other one was <laughs> so long, it made it very difficult. But, um, start again here. There's the loop. Why won't that show up? There's the loop. And you just put the loop. Sorry, 
I should put my other glasses on, as you know, they, they slide you down the nose ones. Um, and then put the loop, put the needle through the loop, basically. And then you pull it and it anchors it fairly well. As I say, it does slide out from, on occasion. But I think if you've got control of your needle, well, at least you go getting somewhere. But anyway, so that's, I think that probably was a bit of a waste of time <laughs> trying to show you that, but anyway. Um, now the other thing is, just a word about Hardanger. After Marilyn Levitt Imblem, she always advised, well, she didn't always advise, she did advise for people who like their skin to be one over one, but also like to do the larger squares in the rest of the design to use Hardanger. And as opposed to Ada, because Ada is quite difficult to split. Now, here's Ada there. And you know, I'm a big fan of Ada. And there's Hardanger. Now, as you can see, the Ada is constructed in a very different way to the Hardanger because, um, well, it just is. I won't go into it because I've done this before in another video anyway. But if you look carefully at Hardanger, you can see two distinct threads going that way. And there are also two distinct threads going that way. And they do split evenly into four. So... I'll just show you very close up what I mean. Oh, someone's coming home, so you might hear a bit of noise in the background. So, here's your hard anger, and you can do a, 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 um, a cross over there, and you can also do individual crosses. So there it is that I've tried to show that not only can you do a cross like that, but you can also do the little single crosses. So if you had a, an arm there, for example, where if you're doing a mirabilia or something like that, and you've got skin there and you've got dress there, you can do the dress in the full crosses and the skin, the hard anger will split beautifully into the four squares, uh, yeah, four squares for the four crosses to do the finer work. And I think that is one of the reasons why Hardanger can be so good. And for my Harlequin piece that I'm going to be getting back to, I am using Hardanger because when it comes to his actual uh, skin, I want to do that one over one. And this is the hard anger that I'm doing at the moment. Lots of confetti in there. And I'm looking forward to getting back to him. Now then, we finally come to the reason why I've left a couple of Teresa Wenslers till the end. Now we have the Camelot sampler there and we also have the castle sampler there she probably imagined him when she was sitting on her lounge room floor not watching tv <laughs> now these i'm going to be giving away so this is how I'm going to do it. Now, in the comments below, I have a question, and you must be over 18, uh, you must be a subscriber, and do not mention giveaway in the title, because if you do, I shall have to delete it. And as you know, I'm very good at doing that. <laughs> so, um, now, this is Monday, the 5th of February, 2018. And the competition will close 
on the 19th of February 2018. So that's a couple of weeks. Now the question is, name one of Henry VIII's wives. And also, what I've done here, if you notice, I've put a number one on the Camelot sampler and number two on the castle sampler. So when you do the wife's name, if you could do your preference, if you would rather have one, put one, and if you'd rather have two, of course, put two. So if, if for example, you come out of the drawer, and next to your name, if you're the first one, and next to your name, you've got number one, well, naturally enough, that will be the one you will get. And then after that, it's whoever, you know, even if the next person says one, they will get two. So I'm not going to, uh, for example, if somebody comes out of the barrel, uh, you know, out of the drawing and they've put, I've already allotted one to someone and they've put one next to their name as their preference, they will still get two because they're in it, unless they say, please don't send me two, but I don't think anyone would do that. It's really so that I know that the very first person, this is my long-winded way of saying it, whoever the first person is that is drawn out of the jar or whatever I use to identify people, their preference, they will get the first preference. And then everybody else afterwards will get whichever the second one was, if you see what I mean. I hope that was clearer. It didn't sound clear to me, but anyway. So, somehow or other, I'm, oh, I was trying to make this a bit shorter, but anyway. Uh, so I hope that uh, I'm going to take some bits out of this because it's, I can see that they're a bit, you know, I've taken a bit too long with trying to explain something that probably you can't explain on a video. Um, but something that I did uh, want to say was that I do appreciate uh, everyone, you know, that takes the time to sit down and have these little tete-a-tetes with me <laughs> every now and again. Um, my videos, I don't do them on a regular basis. I just do them when the moment takes me. So who knows when the next one will be, just like this one. I mean... I was going to do this one a few days after Elizabeth, thinking, oh yes, it's going to be, you know, bright, clear days, because that's what happens in Australia, and ever since then it's been overcast. But today there was a bit of sunshine, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, I wanted the light just to see if I could show you, you know, the metallic threads, but I probably, they didn't come through anyway, so I probably could have just done it in a rainstorm and you wouldn't have known any different <laughs> anyway thank you very much for your company um happy stitching and i'll see you next time bye for now